Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the October edition of ASC eJournal Committee presentation. I am Dr. Srikriti Baskoda, the Vice Chair of the eJournal Committee, and I will be moderating this session. First, I would like to briefly introduce the presenter of today's uh, Journal Club. Uh, she is Dr. Seema Kuti, who is also a member of our ASC eJournal Committee and will be the presenter today. Dr. Kuti is an assistant professor of pathology at the Juker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell Health System in New York, where she also serves as the Women's Health Pathology Fellowship Director. We are very happy to have with us the authors of the article who accepted Dr. Kuti's invitation to join today and she will introduce them shortly. And in the spirit of our interactive presentation, we encourage the audience to be engaged. Please use the question box to post your questions, comments, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. With that, I will turn the virtual podium to Dr. Kuti. The floor is all yours, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sukriti, for kind words and warm welcome. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today for eJournal Committee's live webinar session. Uh, so the article I'm presenting today is uh, Gastric Glomus Tumor on EUS FNA-based Cytology, the Clinopathologic and Immunohistochemical Features of Four Cases, including One Case with Associated MIR-1438 Gene Notch 2 Fusion Gene. The article was recently published in JASC uh, in the month of August this year, and the authors are from the Department of Pathology, Henry Ford, Detroit, Michigan. We are fortunate uh, to have these authors on our live webinar today who has joined us for any questions. If you guys have, we can uh, discuss it at the end. I have no disclosures. Uh, this is again me. Uh, and these are our authors, Dr. Samir Ariel, who is the first author on this article, and he's currently doing his cytopathology fellowship at Cleveland Clinic, Ohio. Um, and Dr. Lissy Yuan, she's uh, the primary investigator and she is a senior staff pathologist at Henry Ford Hospital. So the objectives of this article were to recognize the characteristic morphological features of glomus tumor in fine needle aspiration cytology and to be able to differentiate gastric glomus tumor from its mimicker in cytology specimen to be able to establish a panel of immunohistochemical stains to confirm the diagnosis of gastric glomus tumor and to discuss the characteristic molecular genetic findings of gastric glomus tumor. Little bit background. So glomus tumors are basically a mesenchymal neoplasms that arise from the modified smooth muscle cells of perivascular glomus body. They usually occur in young adults and there is no gender predilections. And the most common site usually is a subingual location and distal extremities. However, they do occur at other sites, such as visceral organs, bone, as well as mediastina. <clears throat> Talking about the gastrointestinal glomus tumor, stomach is the most common site, especially the antrum. It usually occurs as either intramural or submucosal nodules. They arise from the submucosa or the muscularis propria of the gastric wall. Usually they are benign. Only one to 6% of these cases can be malignant. Upon microscopy, they are composed of three main components, which are glomus cells, central vascular spaces, and smooth muscle. And depending on the relative proportion of these three components, they can be further subdivided either, either into a solid glomus tumor, glomangioma, or glomangiomyoma. Their basic immunoprofile, usually they are positive for smooth muscle markers such as SMA, calponin, and H. caldesmone. And they can show variable co-expression for CD34 and collagen type 4. Desmin and synaptophysin can be positive in subset of gastric glomus cells. They are usually negative for cytokeratins, CKID, PDGFRA, S100, and chromogranin. Frequent TLE expression has also been noted in benign subcutaneous glomus tumors. However, usually the mucosal glomus tumors were negative. Management, the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy recently recommended against the surveillance of asymptomatic gastrointestinal tract leiomyomas, lipomas, heterotopic pancreas, granular cell tumors, schwannomas, or glomus tumor 
if the diagnosis were clear. However, they do suggest a surveillance of asymptomatic gastric submucosal lesion if they do not have a definitive diagnosis. And usually an endoscopic resection is an option after the failure of attempts to obtain a diagnosis. In here, the, in present study, the authors aim to document the diagnostic yield of EUSFNA with rapid on-site evaluation for gastric glomus tumor and highlight the cytomorphologic as well as the immunohistochemical findings in differentiating these glomus tumors from chest neuroendocrine tumors, lyomyoma, and schwannoma. So before I move on to my uh, case discussion, I have one question for Dr. Yuran. What was the motivation or the inspiration to start this project? Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Kudi. Uh, we know most, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we know most uh, uh, glomus tumors are, there are extremity uh, locations and we generally will not expect to encounter one during EUSFNA procedures. Uh, I had a case last year, the patient was an uh, older gentleman with a recently diagnosed uh, lung cancer. Uh, during the workup, uh, they, uh, they found a two centimeter gastric uh, tumor and the clinical team uh, was worried about the metastasis. You know? uh, they did the EUSFNA, uh, I was called to do the rows, um, the rapid onsite evaluation. I examined the smears, but I wasn't sure what uh, the cells were. Uh, they looked very bland. Um, so I told the clinician uh, it was not, definitely not the metastatic lung adenocarcinoma, uh, but I, uh, it was suspicious for a neuroendocrine tumor because the, the very bland look of the tumor cells. Uh, I requested the two additional passes uh, designated for cell block. Uh, because I knew this case uh, would need a lot of uh, immunostims. And then um, the, H the IHCs, uh, the tumor cells were positive for SMA and synaplabysin, uh, and they show focal positivity for CKIT, uh, but the tumor cells were negative for AE1-3, so it's not neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, I, uh, I was a little bit, uh, at that moment, I think, um, I thought this was a glomus tumor, but I was a little bit confused uh, why CK was positive. So I ordered the molecular testing. Uh, and luckily this tumor has uh, notch one fu uh, fusion genes. So I was able to make the diagnosis of a glomus tumor. Uh, it's just uh, because it's so rare and then it's a difficult case. So I was hoping uh, by doing this study, um, Dr. Uh, Ariel and I uh, will be able to contribute a little bit to the literature and may uh, facilitate uh, the diagnosis of this right tumor uh, for others in the future. Thank you. So now I will move forward with the uh, details of the each case uh, they came across in their institute. Uh, the case first is a 61-year-old male uh, who presented to emergency department in three month history of progressive um, right lower quadrant and upper quadrant epigastric pain and early satiety. On CT scan, a 2.3 centimeter nodule extending from the greater curvature of mid stomach was noted. Follow, she, he was followed up for many years and afterwards an EUS guided FNA of nodule was performed. On cytomorphology, it showed loose clusters of small to medium-sized cells with centrally located nuclei, inconspicuous nucleoli, and moderate amount of eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm. And admix within those cells were endothelial cells with spindle to C-shaped nuclei, and few cells also appeared as signet ring cells. As we can see here on this stiff quick slide, small to medium brown tumor cells, centrally located nuclei, and scant to moderate amount of cytoplasm, and we can appreciate the mild nuclear pleomorphism. This V is from the cell block, uh, and here again, sheets of those small to round cells with centrally located nuclei, and we can even appreciate a little bit of clearing of the cytoplasm. Here, the arrow is trying to show uh, that few cells did appear as a signet ring. However, it is may not be clear on the screen. Uh, and the C is just a 
section from the resection, which has similar histomorphologic findings of sheets and nodules of the small to round ovoid cells. On immunistochemistry, they are showing diffusely positive for SMA and focal positivity for cyanaptophyxin. Patient underwent gastrectomy and a 2.5 centimeter gastric domus tumor with negative resection margin was noted and there was no vascular invasion. Tumor showed a small solid pattern of RAM cells, again with monotonous nuclei, inconspicuous nucleoli, and small amount of clear cytoplasm. Patient two was a 38 year old male. Uh, again, presented with epigastric discomfort and history of chronic nonspecific gastritis, hepatocellular carcinoma, and cirrhosis. On endoscopy, it showed a gastric submucosal nodule, and FNA of this nodule was performed, which showed relatively small and uniform tumor cells with perinuclear clearing, and the tumor cells were separated by traversing delicate vascular network. On immunohistochemistries, these tumor cells were diffusely positive for SMA, focally positive for cyanoptophysin, and negative for pancytokeratin, CKIT, CD34, and S100. And a cytologic diagnosis of gastric glomus tumor was rendered. And again, this patient was followed up clinically, and there was no further significant events. Patient three is a little older, our elderly patient with a 70-year uh, female who had a history of gastroesophageal reflux disease and was found to have a smooth uh, submucosal nodule in her stomach. And the scopic showed 2.5 centimeter submucosal nodule in the gastric entrum. FNA smear showed loose clusters of small round to oval cells with homogeneous chromatin and a subset with a strip nuclei with micronuclei. And a cluster even appeared to be arising from a vessel wall. Cell block showed small round to spindle cells with a centrally located nuclei, inconspicuous nucleoli, and cells had abundant to scant eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm. Small vessels lined by endothelial cells were noted. The squamoid appearing polygonal cells with mild polymorphism were also noted and a poorly formed rosette was seen at the edge. On immunohistochemistry, tumor cells were positive for SMA, synaptophysin, HH3, uh, 5, caldesmon, and CD34 was focally positive. They were negative for CKIT, pencytokeratin, DOG1, CK7, 20, chromogranin, and MIB1 proliferation index was low, around 1%. Again, and this pictures here, we can identify these cluster of round to small ovoid cells with scan cytoplasm. And this in the background, we can even appreciate this endothelial lining of our vessel traversing or at the edge of this tumor cluster. And this is a from cell block, again, demonstrating the similar small to round cells. And it appears to be, these tumor cells appear to be attached to this vessel wall, which is traversing through that. <clears throat> on the cell block in the seed is again an image of um, cell block here the arrow is trying to demonstrate this squamoid appearing cells uh, and there was this uh, small vessel traversing through here as well slide D I mean the picture D here again demonstrate diffuse positivity for SMA and focal positivity for cyanoptophysin and picture e, uh, e and F again that just highlights that pancytokeratins were negative. Patient did had a concurrent biopsy of the and which showed a gastric enteral mucosa with small fragments of neoplasm again composed of small to monotonous cells round a nuclei and small amount of cytoplasm. They were arranged in quads and nest with a delicate vascular structure. Uh, on immunistic chemistry, they had SMA, H-caldesmon, HH335, and cyanoptophysin positive, and CD30 was focally positive. However, pencytokeratin, CAM5.2, CDX2 chromogranin, CD56, S100, and CK were negative, with the MIBAN proliferation index was low at approximately 1%. And these findings, again, were consistent with the gastric glomus tumor. 
last case, which is patient four, a 71-year-old male presented with a complaint of chest discomfort. On CT4 cup, a 6.4 centimeter mass was noted in the left upper lobe of the lung. But patient also had a mediastinal and right right uh, eighth rib metastasis, and as well as an additional 2.0 centimeter gastric enteral lesion. Afterwards, a PET scan was performed and which confirmed the metabolic activity in the left lung mass, mediastinum, as well as the rib. However, the gastric tumor was not metabolically active. Endoscopic showed, endoscopy showed a gastric wall tumor and EUSFNA was performed. On direct and thin prep smears, there were these large cohesive fragments, uh, cohesive tissue fragments consisting of small round to ovoid nuclei, uh, cells with overlapping of nuclei, as we can appreciate here, and inconspicuous nucleoli. Um, authors here by error, they are trying to demonstrate a rare intranuclear inclusions, which were seen in this case. And thus on the image B, they are trying to demonstrate a tortuous small blood vessel, which appeared as an endothelial wrapping around this tumor cluster, which was noted. On the cell block here, as we can see, there's a round to small avoid tumor cells, uh, and this there are, may, uh, appear to be arising and adjacent to this many blood vessels, which are even staghorny a little bit in appearance. Uh, there were little uh, hemosiderin laden macrophages noted in the stroma, but they also noticed a little bit of spindling uh, of these tumor cells. And this is again the higher power image of the similar cell block, uh, trying to demonstrate those spindle cells uh, in this case. IHC was positive for SMA as shown here in E, uh, and synaptophysin was also focally positive. Rare cells were positive for CKIT as well as noted in this picture here. However, tumor cells were negative for A1A3, CK7, TTF1, napsin, P40, chromogranin, DOG1, CD34, Desmin, S100, HMB45, and SOX10. And the care proliferation index here was around 2%. And solid tumor uh, case was also sent up for a solid tumor fusion panel of 50 genes. And um, it was positive for MIR 143-HG notch 2 fusion gene. Next is this demo, uh, table one here. The authors have dem nicely demonstrated and summarized all the findings of these all four cases, which we, I just discussed before. And as we note here, all cases were positive for synaptophysin. So my next question is for Dr. Samir. Um, so as you have uh, mentioned that all tumor cells were, at, I mean, all, tumor, all cases were at least focally positive for synaptophysin in this series. Is this similar to the findings reported uh, by other studies published in literature? And if yes, what was the percentage positivity in those studies? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kuti, for the, your question. Uh, it's definitely helpful to compare our findings with uh, those reported in the literature. So uh, from our review, we observed that uh, methanin et al. Uh, they had reported synaptophysin positivity in uh, about three out of 17 cases, which was approximately uh, 18%. Uh, Wang et al. had found two out of 11 cases to be uh, positive for synaptophysin. So that was also around 18%. Uh, again, Lin et al. had documented a positivity uh, rate of around 14% with three out of 21 cases in positivity. Uh, there was a recent uh, case study uh, by uh, Caleb Stel with uh, which reported one case with focal positivity for synaptophysin. Uh, J.C. Wang et al. had noted five out of six cases, a roughly 83% uh, expression of synaptophysin. Uh, Min Ying Deng et al. had documented 13 out of 15 cases to be positive for synaptophysin. Uh, that was roughly around 87%, and the uh, expression of synaptophysin was variable. So, uh, so this, like from our own collective review, we observed that 27 out of 71 cases expressed uh, synaptophysin. Uh, however, it's important to remember that this does, this does not encompass all studies that are available, and uh, but this definitely provides a comparative perspective on the prevalence of synaptophysin expression. Thank you.
thank you for the detailed uh, comparison with all other studies as well. Uh, that was helpful. Moving on, now uh, we will uh, move forward with the discussion. So the diagnostic rate of USFNA of gastric smooth muscle uh, submucosal tumors, if they are usually in two, less than two centimeter in size, is approximately 73%, ranging from 66 of 90 cases reported by one study. Another study reported the diagnostic yield of USFNA with rose to be 100% uh, for gastric uh, submucosal tumors. However, for gastric glomus tumor, a meta-analysis reported a diagnostic rate of around 12%. In these cases, ROSE was performed for three cases uh, with indeterminate finding for all cases due to blend cytomorphology. So my next um, question is for uh, Dr. Yuan. Um, so how is ROSE diagnosis given um, at your institute? Are the pathologists present in person while giving ROSE diagnosis or is it virtually given? And also if you can elaborate on the indeterminate findings of all three cases in your series. Okay. Uh, at Harry Ford Hospital, uh, we go to the US meet in person. Uh, they are actually in another building, but on the same floor. So there's a skywalk, we just go there. Once the slides are ready, um, the slides uh, like our cytotech will go there first. Okay. And then we give the road diagnosis interoperatively to, uh, you know, to the clinician. And so they can decide whether they need more passes or that that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time it was uh, uh, the, the settled technician called us to confirm an, a malignancy. But uh, in this case, I mean, in this series, uh, all three cases, uh, uh, they were difficult because uh, the settled techs, they didn't know what they were, like what they were, they were seeing. Uh, so they called us to uh, asking for help, basically. But then uh, we gave the, like for those three cases, including my own, uh, we gave the diagnosis of uh, indeterminate uh, because uh, at the time of the, uh, the rose, basically it's uh, like frozen section for search pass, right? Uh, I didn't know uh, whether, uh, I, I knew they were regional tissue, but I didn't know what kind of tumor it is. Uh, so we usually gave an indeterminate diagnosis for uh, for uh, new plasms like uh, neuroendocrine tumor or uh, some soft tissue soft tissue tumor like just you know because uh, later on we need to do uh, more immunos uh, to uh, you know to, uh, to further classify the tumor. Uh, here at Harm Report, uh, like we we have a consensus among uh, we have uh, seven cytopathologists. Uh, we have a consensus among us, like we do not use indeterminate rose diagnosis, uh, you know, uh, freely. Uh, we use that term ca uh, cautiously uh, because we don't want to give uh, the clinicians a false hope of they might get the tumor and then uh, we can give them a final diagnosis, I mean, uh, a definitive diagnosis on, on when we see, receive the cell block and then on, on final diagnosis. So we don't want to give them that uh, kind of false hope. So we usually use this, this reserve this term just for like we thought it could be neuronocorrent or like just something like that. Understood. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move forward um, further into discussion. So here this table nicely demonstrates the different um, cytomorphological features as well as immunoprofile and molecular findings of the more common tumor at this location. So the glomus tumor and the neuroendocrine tumor are more closer mimics when we have round to small cells. Uh, however, just leiomyoma and schwannoma does come into differential diagnosis where we have a component of spindle cell or more of myoid component in a glomus tumor than we have more, uh, those kind of differential comes into play. So comparing glomus tumor versus neuroendocrine tumor, as we just compared the cellularity, glomus tumor tends to be low to moderately cellular. However, neuroendocrine tumor usually have moderate to high cellularity. Co uh, glomus tumor tends to have cohesive clusters of tumor cells. However, neuroendocrine tumors can have these dispersed uniform cells as well, uh, along with small groups uh, in these um, smears. 
uh, comparing the cells itself on glomus tumor these uniform round cells will have ill-defined cytoplasmic border but we can also identify vessels with spindled endothelial cells uh, either traversing or adjacent to these tumor cells however these vessels are usually not present in neuroendocrine uh, tumor uh, smears Nuclear details, usually glomus tumors have centrally located rounds uh, nuclei with a smooth nuclear membrane and delicate chromatin. However, neuroendocrine tumor can have eccentric nuclei and as we all know, the salt and pepper, the classic chromatin pepper, which clinches the diagnosis for neuroendocrine tumor. Cytoplasm are usually scant or eosinophilic to clear uh, in glomus tumor and it could be moderate and eosinophilic to granular in neuroendocrine tumor. IHCs, which is our best uh, helpful tool, we can use is SMA, H. caldesmon, which is positive in glomus tumor. Synaptophysin can be variable and CD34. However, the chromogranin can be a helpful marker here to distinguish uh, these two as that will be positive in neuroendocrine tumor and not glomus tumor. Molecular findings, MIR-143 notch gene fusion is identified in more than 50% of the glomus tumors and there is limited data on pancreatic as well as small intestine uh, neuroendocrine tumor for the molecular findings. Comparing the spindle cell lesions, which are chist, lyomyomas, and schwannoma at this location, cellularity-wise, chist usually tend to be have moderate to high cellularities, whereas the other two have low to moderate uh, cellularities. Um, all these tumors tend to have a fascicular tissue fragments, uh, just do not usually have dispersed cells in the background. However, the in schwannoma, the classic findings, um, morphological hint will be the loose fascicles of these spindle cells. And we can even notify this fibrillary matrix in the background if we are um, lucky. And comparing the cells itself, they are usually spindled or epithelioid in sheep uh, in chest. Uh, and in lyomyoma, they can be spindled or cigar-shaped uh, cells. Uh, and in schwannomas, we have narrow cells with elongated and wavy with tapered end. The nuclear details usually just have oval to elongated nuclei with granular chromatin and conspicuous nuclei. However, lyomyomas tend to have these blunt ended nuclei and open chromatin. And schwannomas, as we know, they are these curvilinear or coma shaped nuclei with dense chromatin and inconspicuous nuclei. Granular to eosinophilic cytoplasm and chist, and lyomyomas tend to have these abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. And schwannomas tend to have this filamentous bipolar uh, cytoplasm. I see um, S100 and SOX10 can be helpful for identifying the schwannomas. However, lyomyomas are all smooth muscle markers such as SMA, Desmond, H. Caldesmon, and just as we know, 95% of them will be positive for SICKIT. Dog one is more sensitive, being in 98% of the cases, and CD34 in 82% of the cases. Mutations, again, uh, the activating mutations are in 75% of the cases of chist will be secret. However, 10% can have PDGFRA mutations or SDH deficiency, deficient in 1% to 2% of the cases. Lyomyomas are known for their MED12 mutations in 70% of the cases, and few cases, uh, approximately around 40% of the cases, can have HMGA2 or HMGA1 rearrangements or rarely FH mutations. Schwannomas can be associated with neurofibromatosis type 2 and loss of function of Marley gene. So this table has nicely demonstrated all the differential diagnosis and helpful tool for us to reach the specific diagnosis at this location. Um, so gastric glomus tumor have been reported as a well-circumscribed intramural masses. Usually their size ranges from 1.5 centimeter to 8 centimeter. There was a study done by Paul Pittel. He studied atypical glomus tumors and he categorized these lesions with worrisome features into either malignant glomus tumors, symplastic glomus tumor, or glomus tumor of uncertain malignant potential. If the tumors were present at a deeper location and with a size of more than two centimeters with atypical mitotic figures or moderate to high nuclear grade with more than five or at least five mitosis per 50 high power field, then he classified these tumors as malignant. 
However, if the high nucleate rate was present, but there were no other features, then they were classified as symplastic glomus tumors. And the glomus tumor of uncertain malignant potential was reserved for the tumors that did not fill the criteria for malignancies, but it did show one atypical feature other than nuclear pyromorphism. Then it will be a gastric, I mean, it will be a glomus tumor of uncertain malignant potential. Here in this series, authors have shown that there were nuclear pyromorphism noted in case one, three, and four. However, there were no other atypical findings and they were all diagnosed as a benign. <clears throat> this again table nicely uh, summarizes different studies done on gastric glomus tumor diagnosed by USFNA. And as we can see here, um, they were all mostly located in the entrum of the stomach. And most of these studies either were the case report or there were uh, one uh, study by Wong et al. which had 11 cases and Saudit et al. which had five total cases. The sizes again range same on around from two to three centimeter, all of them. And the morphological findings were similar to what authors have noted uh, in their study and similar findings in immunoprofile. However, I do have a question here for uh, Dr. Samir that uh, as you have mentioned in your description of each cases and the, some of the unusual morphological findings you have described were like squamoid cells, signet ring cells, including focal rosette formation and intranuclear inclusions. Uh, so has, been, has this been reported before? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Dr. Priti. So uh, Daniel, Vinet, Lutek, et al. have uh, documented the presence of intranuclear inclusions uh, in their study. However, uh, in regards to other features that you've mentioned, like uh, squamoid cells, signet ring cells, and focal rosette formation, uh, based on our review, uh, we are not aware of these features being reported in the literature. Yeah, because rosette form uh, formation can definitely mimic the neuroendocrines, especially when you have this morphology. So I guess the chromagrin will be the clinching helpful diagnosis uh, to meet the diagnosis. Um, Thank you for that comment. And moving on to next slide. So finally, the Agarimita, he has studied 93 cases of glomus tumor uh, for fish uh, inside to hybridization for notch one to four. And he identified that rearrangement for notch genes were seen in more than half of the glomus tumor and of which notch two MIR-143 was the most common fusion. There was another recent study of benign as well as malignant glomus tumor, which also reported notch three gene rearrangement, notch gene rearrangements. Uh, overall, notch two gene arrangements were identified in 52% of glomus tumor, including all malignant cases, and notch three G arrangement were identified in approximately 9% of the glomus tumor. In addition, TLA expressions were predominantly de detected in subcutaneous glomus tumors and not in mucosal glomus tumors. BRFE V600E mutations was detected in malignant glomus tumor or glomus tumor of uncertain malignant potential. So long-term follow-up of gastric glomus tumor could be required because possibility does exist for malignant transformation. However, at present, there are no clear guidelines available regarding the staging or prognosis of gastric glomus tumor. The treatment of gastric glomus tumor at the current uh, times is just a local resection with negative surgical margins. An analysis of these surgical specimen can be helpful to confirm the cytologic diagnosis and better evaluate if there are any other atypical features present. And VRAF could be a promising therapeutic target in future for the malignant cases. Conclusion, um, so others have nicely dom documented here the clinopathological as well as immunohistochemical features of four cases of benign gastric glomus tumor, including one case with uh, MIR-143 at G notch to fusion gene. Gastric glomus tumors should be considered in the differential diagnosis of epithelioid cyst, lyomyoma, schwannomas, or neuroendocrine tumor of the stomach. And EUSF 
FNA-based cytology with rose immunohistochemical stains and molecular studies can be helpful in preoperative diagnosis of gastric glomus tumor and can help to guide the clinical management, including the targeted surgical intervention. And I will conclude here and thank you all for your kind attention. We have beautiful fall season here in Northeast. So whoever has not visited New York, please come and visit us in this season. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Kare. That was brilliantly done. And thank you, uh, Dr. Wan and Dr. Ariel for your great participation as well. Uh, I am keeping an eye on the question box. I don't see any uh, questions so far. Uh, you know, I'm really amazed. I have never seen a gastric glomus tumor in my limited practice of two years um, here at Columbia, and this was indeed a very nicely done study. I'm really impressed by the cell block quantity too. <laughs> yes, that was yeah. nice. It was similar to the resection. Right. Yeah, I don't think I ever got such a um, such a good cellularity. Um, in the same um, area, I wanted to ask Dr. Wan, what morphology alarmed you to order, you know, more stains and think about glomus tumor in the differential? Was there an amazing finding that was uh, kind of concerning or? Okay, those kind of cases are always difficult. So uh, I, my own case, I did, uh, you know, uh, in three batches, you know. Uh, because uh, the first of it, because I was thinking about neuroendocrine tumor, I think that's because they look epithelioid, they are not that spindled, you know, so that's always the first uh, like top differential uh, diagnosis, but then they are AE13 negative. So then you notice, uh, okay, it's not a, a carcinoma, right, if it's, it's not epithelial uh, neoplasm. So the next batch, I usually include uh, like something like uh, epithelioid gist. So I order a panel stain like a CK, uh, doc one, uh, SMA, you know, uh, and then uh, I whenever I order SMA, I'll, I always order Desmin. So in this case, it's just uh, it's enamphofacin positive, AE13 negative, and then uh, you know uh, Desmin negative. So uh, there are no other tumors that will have the similar panel. You know, like the results like this. Uh, the only thing is the almost tumor. And then uh, I asked the one of our GI pathologists here at Henry Ford, and she said, "Yeah, they they know they uh know the like gastric glomus tumors. Uh, more than half, like 50 percent, of them will have synaptophysis. Uh, sometimes it's very strong, like my case. Uh, it's always uh, a very hard, difficult case for them as well. But luckily, I mean." Uh, the, if you think about, if you keep this in your differential diagnosis, uh, the immunostein actually can solve this problem very well, you know, on cytology pre preparations because they are uh, keratin negative and they are synaptophysin positive and they are SMA positive, but they are desmin negative. So it's a nice panel. Uh, but my case is uh, the tumor somehow decided to um, take a, a little bit of CK on. So that's why I need a uh, molecular testing. Otherwise, you really don't need to, to do that. Right, thank you so much, Dr. Wan. I think expanding the panel to include, like you suggested, uh, synaptophysin and pancytogradin um, is really helpful to not miss these uh, kind of rare tumors. Uh, it was really well presented. I don't see any questions. Um, uh, till now. So I think we are at the end. Uh, thank you again for in, uh, accepting our invitation, Dr. Kuti's invitation and being here. Uh, and th thank you, Dr. Kuti, for your um, presentation as well. Uh, we'll see you next month in uh, Austin, Texas. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll see you guys. I'll stop by and see, say hi. <laughs> yeah. That's my take is yesterday. <laughs> Everyone in Austin. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuti, for uh, selecting Thank our so uh, much, Yeah, to uh, so uh, we are glad to share our uh, experience in making the diagnosis of uh, gastric glomus tumor, and then uh, we are uh, we feel honored that uh, we can uh, you know uh, uh, share our studies and the results with the audience. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuti and Dr. Vaskata. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.